Okay. So welcome everyone to Dev BTS channel, and today we have Tejas with us as our guest, and he's my colleague right now at Middlewest, but uh, he's more senior than me in the IT field. He's been working as a professional for last 20 years. So I'm very excited to learn technical and uh, career-wise how, how his journey has been. So so let's uh, get started. Uh, hello, Tejas, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you, Kemal, uh, for inviting me on your podcast. I'm yeah. happy to be here. Yeah, and thank you for waking up early on Sunday morning to be on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's 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 eight thirty a.m. around eight thirty a.m. here, so it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, understood. So for doing this interview, I just I actually did some research on LinkedIn and stuff, and to see what your journey have been uh, like career wise. And I uh, I am surprised that you have worked with many popular names like Netflix and Cisco and whatnot. But I would like to go at the very start, and I would like to know how uh, you decided to be in the IT field in the first place, like in the schooling or in the college. What was your first instinct of being in the IT field? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, growing up, uh, I was... Uh more leaning towards mathematical mind. My mind was more mathematical and not so much on the languages and uh, other aspects. So growing up, uh, I was strong in mathematics, uh, science to a certain extent. And that kind of, uh, as I was going through my 10th grade and 12th grade, that kind of naturally leaning towards more logical uh, type of uh, courses or subjects. Uh, and naturally, when I passed my 12th grade, uh, I had a very good score in mathematics and not so much good score in other subjects. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when, and this was around uh, year 1999, uh, computers were still kind of a new thing in India, especially the home computers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was fortunate enough that, you know, my dad bought me a used Pentium 2 uh, CPU mm -hmm. machine. Uh, and I was like... Uh, in, in the summer of 1999, I was like, I spent a lot of time uh, playing around, you know, back then I was like trying to install Linux. Somehow I, I figured I could get a CD of Linux uh, in, in a small town called Vadodara where I grew up and I was playing around. And that's where my interest in computers uh, sort of started to kick in. And that sort of made me decide that, no, I want to pursue this as my career uh, because I could see working in this industry in the long term. I see, yeah, and and later on you did your masters in the foreign country. So so was that planned or was that after your graduation you thought of going to foreign country to continue? So that that was very interesting. You know, uh, I I did an I did undergrad in India, and back then again uh, the schools or the colleges had a computer infrastructure. Uh, internet infrastructure was not that great, and we always kept reading about how uh, the United States is, is the leader in, you know, research and innovation when it comes to the computers or internet. And I've always wanted to sort of experience what that cutting edge uh, research would be. Uh, and wanted, like, we read so many textbooks from these foreign authors uh, that, you know, I was totally impressed and wanted to, you know, sort of, witness what it would be like to uh, be in this forefront of the technology. And this we are talking about 20 years ago, back in 2003. Uh, so I, when I graduated from an undergrad degree, I had two choices, whether to get into the industry or uh, to do my master's. And that's where I expressed to my parents that I would like to go to further studies uh, in, in the US if possible, uh, because obviously we come from a very middle class background and uh, going to study in a foreign country, uh, spending, mm -hmm. spending money in dollars was a huge uh, thing. Uh, so, but luckily uh, I was fully supported by my parents. Uh, they figured out how we can take care of, you know, the finances of me studying mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the US. And uh, thankfully it all worked out and I was totally happy that, you know, I took that step. Uh, because that really changed my perception as to how how to approach uh, mm -hmm. things in this computer science industry in a completely different way. 
and and with the abundance of resources that I witnessed when I came to the U.S., you know, in terms of the 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 computers or labs or laptops or or you know books or even the access to the faculties and professors, uh, it was very very enriching experience. I see. So going there out and for doing your masters, and then you uh, directly jumped onto your first job, or did you take some time to? learn a few things yourself or doing some freelancing so so how was it after completing the master so uh, it you know i i wish uh, uh, we i would have opportunity to do uh, freelancing or sort of start something of my own back when i graduated from uh, mm -hmm. usc in 2005 because when you are coming out of school which is very uh, you know research oriented uh, and I did uh, a research assistantship at uh, an institute called Information Sciences Institute, which is uh, which is a USC institute where they do all sort of computer science research. So if you have heard of like DNS, it came out of that institute. Uh, so a lot of cutting edge research has been done. And I was in that kind of, you know, uh, research mode when I graduated mm -hmm. and I wanted to try out few things. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the visa situation is such that, you know, at the moment you graduate, you have like a, a year to, to sort of get work visa, else you have to sort of leave the US. So that window of opportunity was not there. And I decided, okay, uh, I'll start working and then, you know, figure out if I want to start uh, something of my own. Uh, and that's where, so, so I didn't have any gap between I, when I graduated and uh, like I had a, like a month between it mm -hmm. uh, before I graduated and before I start working. Okay. So, so in India, it's mostly like now universities provide like on-campus jobs and another thing you directly approach and give interviews. So, so how is the scene there? How do you so, the yeah. so back then, uh, what again, USC is a very international heavy school, especially for master's program. There are a lot of students of uh, international students uh, in, in, in this in the college or in the university. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of competition when it comes to on campus, uh, you know, recruitment. Uh, mm -hmm. But the way most of me and my friends found the job is through, you know, approaching the companies, uh, sending us the resume, setting up the interviews with them. And this is we are talking about 2003. So uh, there were still uh, uh, very traditional things were still very traditional where you you go you approach uh, you go to the recruitment events on the university talk to the pe talk to people hand them their resumes and then uh, probably go home look up on their website uh, and probably apply there as well so uh, we we uh, we went through that I went through that process and uh, I got into a company called Blue Coat Systems uh, which was uh, right into my interest area and again i did my masters in computer science with specialization in computer networking so mm -hmm. i was very heavily into you know all the layer 7 layer 2 to layer 7 stack of computer networking if you are familiar so i got into blue code systems who are who, who was at the time building http proxies http proxies uh, mm -hmm. proxies were a big thing back then because internet infrastructure was not uh, this much evolved so caching and proxying uh, was kind of needed. Uh, and uh, my first job was very, very enriching. I got to experience firsthand how to build an enterprise class appliance, okay. network appliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's how I ended up, you know, in the, into the corporate world in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, 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 great story. Like you have some interesting uh, story going from uh, Vadodara to doing masters in foreign and then choose and uh, getting the job that you like in the computer even in the IT field like you got to choose your journal that you want uh, you were interested in networking and you got a, your first job in the very specific journal so so that's uh, yeah uh, yeah and I was always interested into connecting to computers or you know any sort of network connection be it like phone line or uh, even uh, during my undergrad days i remember me and my friend who also had uh, like an old cpu uh, you know uh, pentium cpu we used to sort of haul 
you know how how big the CPUs and monitors used to be in, in those days, those CRT monitors. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to haul them on on like a, a two wheeler scooter uh, <laughs> and then make sure like you know they are right next to each other. Try to connect uh, them uh, with the Ethernet cable and some switching equipment and see if they communicate. Uh, if you are able to ping, you have some LAN party uh, thing going. So we spent countless you know days and nights sort of figuring it out uh, even before we were taught officially taught uh, how how computer <laughs> networks work. So I, we, like I was always into uh, uh, computer. I was always leaning towards computer networks more, and I'm glad that you know I got an opportunity to you know pursue that. Uh, uh, as my profession in early part of my career. Yeah. So actually, for the computer networks, I am only familiar with it as a subject because uh, in my engineering, I used to get uh, this subject. And there, and then we used to have this tool uh, in our syllabus called Cisco, uh, where you can like a prototype how your network connections will be. You can like uh, put your hubs and switches together and see how that will work and which leads me to the next question that how, how was the transition from the first company to the Cisco because I think Cisco was also a big name at that time in the networking. Or yeah, was yeah. It not that famous at the time. No, it was, it was like Cisco was the, you know, a networking company to be in uh, back in, you know, middle of 2005. Uh, because they have history of you know innovation and bringing new technologies in computer industry, computer networking industry, for more than like you know at the time twenty years. So that was the destination if you are into the computer networking industry. And the way it happened is uh, so at Bluecode Systems I was working on uh, layer seven proxies uh, like you know HTTP proxy, FTP proxy. Uh, and, and the business was doing great, uh, but what I felt was there was some slowdown uh, in that uh, business industry in general. I could see that because the internet infrastructure was improving. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the demand for proxies was sort of reducing more and more. Mm -hmm. And also the second thing is uh, the CDNs of the world, the archives of the world were sort of providing um, solution to what traditional, uh, you know, data center proxy would provide where you have now distributed proxies all across the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I felt, uh, uh, you know, if I could get to work uh, at the more lower layers of networking, like, you know, layer two to layer three routing switching, uh, mm -hmm. that would sort of enrich my uh, experience more because I've already worked a year or a little more than a year on layer seven. Mm -hmm. I understand how application protocols work. Uh, now I want to go deep, uh, dig deep into the you know lower stack of networking, and uh, fortunately uh, the opportunity at Cisco uh, showed up. Uh, I had a few of not friends but acquaintances uh, working at Cisco who referred me, uh, and uh, yeah, I just sent my resume uh, through those friends, and uh, fortunately I got an interview and got accepted. Great, great, great. So. So was that a big work culture shift when you went from your first company to Cisco, like being in a big company, was that like a strict work schedule or anything? Uh, no, actually, you know, uh, to be honest, Cisco was more flexible than I would have thought being <laughs> a big corporate. Uh, because one, uh, you know, Cisco uh, being also having like, you know, the VPN products uh, mm -hmm. and like the work culture I felt was very relaxed where you could work from home if you wanted, you could work from mm -hmm. cafe if you wanted, like, you know, you just need VPN connect to the corporate network and, and you can start working. Uh, so, so it, I felt it was a big company and it had a lot of processes uh, mm -hmm. of, and, and for the for a good reason, but I also felt that it was much more, you know, flexible and much more employee friendly, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so that you know there are no red tapes as you know you have to be at work at 9 a.m and then you know you have to clock in there was no clock in clock out nobody monitored when i came in when i left mm -hmm. uh, so yeah i think uh, and then the good part is that being a big company there were tremendous amount of learning resources available like 
uh, there were a lot of video tutorials available of how Cisco products work. And of course, a lot of expertise within the company in terms of people who are very rich experience. Like back then, and this is, we are talking 2006, back then I met people who had 20 years experience working in, uh, mm -hmm. in this industry. And they yeah. could like tell you stories about, you know, how, how the first Cisco router was built and how it was deployed. Uh, so that was very fascinating. Uh, so overall, I, fe I feel it was a very uh, rich experience uh, yeah. coming to Cisco. Uh, Blue Coat experience was great, but again, it was a, a mid-sized company. Uh, it's it's yeah. still more uh, like profit focused. Uh, Cisco is also profit focused, but then you also have this uh, other aspect where you have a lot of resources uh, to learn. Right. Yeah. With, with these stories, like I al always envy uh, people who joined IT earlier. Like if I was uh, born like 20 years ago, I would like to uh, witness the growth of IT from yeah. the, like the hardware things and inter internet coming up and uh, Facebook stories and all those. But, uh, but let me also tell you, it was <laughs> a good rewarding journey, but <laughs> coming uh you know that the the resources were very scarce yeah. we like we didn't have youtube till you know 2006 <laughs> or so like it's not like you could search for xyz master class and then get you know familiar with the topic uh mm. from people who know uh their stuff uh so the learning material was a little hard to come by you really had to go old school go read books uh, you know, read, read relevant uh, chapters from the books to understand how, how things work. How nobody, like, very less resources where they can teach you, walk walk you through a video and courses like that. So it was, a, it was I would say, more, uh, a little bit more time consuming to come up to the speed because you have to, mm -hmm. one, identify where to learn, uh, like what books or what people to connect to to get this information and the second then you really have to go and read the book or uh, go through the material that the person provides yeah so so i see that it is more challenging than how it is on current time because oh, other than youtube you also have like thousand other resources correct and, yeah and many companies must be doing the same thing that you are doing because in in today's time it's tough to come up with a innovation in the it field because most of the basic things have have already been invented but uh, i see if uh, new innovations can be in the field like ai or observability like some of the emerging fields but the base infrastructure was something that is uh, already established and, and yeah. thanks to guys like you and <laughs> IT people who made this happen no, I think it's it's all you know. The world community has done a tremendous job, especially with the internet, right? Because growing up till 1999, uh, you know, I was like 18 years old back then. No internet, never ex been exposed to a thing called internet, and now I see kids these days with you know who have grown up with smartphones, who have grown up with the internet, so they take it as granted. Uh, just like when we were growing up, we sort of took you know, uh, the availability of electricity as sort of granted, uh, even though erratic at times in India, but it was still like something that, you know, uh, I grew up with, uh, fortunately. So mm -hmm. it's the next generation now that take like the things like internet and, you know, uh, availability of resources at their fingertips uh, as yeah. granted. So I think it's, it's a great step forward. So, so what, you came up with this uh, scarcity of resource thing. So, uh, um, the next question is: did, did Cisco and major companies are the only ones who had the Wi-Fi setup, or how, how did how do you guys work? No, even smaller companies uh, had a wireless, uh, you know, Wi-Fi networks uh, setup. So, yeah. I think by two thousand three uh, or so uh, Wi-Fi was pretty prevalent, at least across in the United States. Even when I was studying in, in, in USC, uh, we had Wi-Fi networks all over the university back then. Uh, okay. So I think it was pretty prevalent. Uh, it was just being uh, coming from India, you know, even buying a laptop of my own <laughs> was a big thing. You know, it was used to cost like thousand or fifteen hundred dollars back then. Okay. Uh, so it was a it was a big amount 20 years ago at least for for me uh, and even that was a major decision whether you know i should buy a laptop or i should go something you know more traditional with a desktop so 
it's just uh, but across the us i could see wifi was was pretty prevalent in either universities or offices okay i see and after uh, cisco you moved to another uh, network based company called atin so so i i i can see the pattern that like a uh, heavy amount of initial years you have been into networking and i think atin was the last in that sequence like for the networking part yeah yeah so i spent uh, close to 6 six, six and a half years at cisco working on you know uh, layer 2 uh, technologies like you know vlan spanning tree protocols uh, uh, routing protocols uh, and then i felt uh, that okay i've spent 6 and a half years on this lot of l2 l3 stack of networking uh, and i need to sort of expand my knowledge uh, and understanding uh, start working on on a different area uh, mm-hmm. and back then uh, this is around 2012 2013 uh, software defined mm-hmm. networking or sdn uh, was was up and coming was a huge thing uh, so i felt I, sh- i should start you know playing around that because till now till or till then till to 2012 mm-hmm. i was mostly into a network appliance like you know physical switch or a router uh with with you know really li- real line cards and asics and all that uh, mm-hmm. but now the industry was shifting more uh, cloud was picking up more uh, you know software defined network functions virtualization like the, the physical router or switch i was working on is now virtualized mm-hmm. uh, so i felt i need to move uh, you know a little bit higher where you know the orchestration of network uh, is is more is, is something i can work with Uh, so an eight and kind of provided me that bridge because if you work for for a in a particular area for a long time you kind of tend to get stereotyped into oh, you oh this is a layer two layer three person and that kind of becomes a little challenging to break into other fields so you need you need a bridge which can cross which can help you cross into the other side uh, so eight and networks at the time was uh, building uh, a uh, feature for their load balancers uh, mm-hmm. called a uh, uh, vxlan or you know the virtual tunneling uh, mm-hmm. so that is to you know allow all these virtual uh, now virtualized appliances to talk mm-hmm. to each other over the traditional internet because now you are flipping the model right mm-hmm. your appliances are now using internet as a as a connectivity mechanism not necessarily providing the connectivity Okay. Uh, so, 8N network at the time was building uh, VXLAN support, and uh, that sort of VXLAN uh, is kind of a, a, an L2 L3 technology, uh, mm-hmm. but then it's virtual. But they they were virtualizing their load balancer, okay. uh, so it becomes like a service. Uh, you know, like today you go to AWS and launch uh, an mm-hmm. ELB. It's a service, right? So, yeah. uh, so I work. Uh, I I was. Like I said, okay, now it's the time I can sort of make this move. I have a bridge uh, mm-hmm. to get into SDN world. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, and then uh, that's where I again sort of went from a bigger company with you know more than sixty seventy thousand people with is a small to a smaller company with less than you know uh, three mm-hmm. four thousand people. Uh, uh, it's still a still a big company, but not at the scale uh, as of Cisco uh, that was coming from. Uh, and at eight and networks uh, i think it was a very rewarding experience because again when you work for a bigger company for a while you kind of become very comfortable you know the processes you know the pace at which uh, the company moves but again when you go to a smaller company it it moves very fast you have to change your uh, uh, working habits mm-hmm. so yeah it was uh, a great experience uh, at eight and networks as well mm-hmm. Yeah. I I love the fact that you had the, this clarity over your career path. That first you wanted to learn the layer seven of the networking, and then you went deeper. And also you understood that how the IT world is changing, and you need a bridge to go to the cloud. So so it it uh, represents that you had a really good uh, grasp of concepts around the networking, and you make the right rewards at the time. So. so that's something to learn i i, I uh, consider this in my yeah. <laughs> career path i mean you have to keep your eyes and ears open right sometimes what happens is uh, you have, if you have been working uh, at a company or with the technology for a long time you you sort of tend to get into this comfort zone oh i know how this thing works at yeah. my fingertips 
uh, and you know uh, i go to work every day i get this thing done come home uh, you know the life is cool uh, yeah. but over time what i have felt is it, it tends to hurt you because that because in our field industry right technology moves really fast right mm-hmm. and you have to always keep on learning uh, to to be you know relevant in the market uh so so that always has motivated me to you know keep eyes and ears open what's going on in the industry uh, and i've been fortunate enough to live in 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 the silicon valley uh, bay area where you know you can really observe things moving uh, right from ground zero right like i can see i can talk to people i meet people who, who tell me something and then i say oh, oh my god this is news to me I, I attend a lot of meetups that happen locally, uh, so that I get to know uh, where a particular industry is moving. And not just networking. I, I attend like database meetups, or I attend any any sort of meetups that I feel are relevant, even slightly relevant. I go and attend them so that I can get the pulse of where uh, those industries are moving, and if that is something that you know interests me in the future. I see. So, so as you mentioned about the Silicon Valley, so when you switched your job, did you also uh, switch to your cities, or uh, you were working on the from the same uh, city all the time? Uh, it's pretty much the same uh, city or the region, I would say. I mean, the Silicon Valley is is made up of like a larger region. Uh, mm-hmm. It has bunch of cities like you know San Jose, Palo Alto, Mountain View, you know San mm-hmm. Francisco. Uh, mm-hmm. So overall, this this I think is. Uh, I think 50, 60 mile stretch uh, around the uh, around the San Francisco Bay Area is is what is loosely termed as Silicon Valley. Uh, though mostly the south the south of the valley had more industries or more companies till mm-hmm. late till 2010, and then San Francisco picked up post 2010. Uh, so so I was always in the area after I graduated uh, from USC. Mm-hmm. I see, and and once you realize that the cloud is something uh, that is coming up, and then you switch from eight and to digital ocean. We I have worked on uh, digital ocean a bit, and I uh, compared to AWS, I think it's uh, something medium sized uh, cloud platform. But but what was the impression of digital ocean at at that time, and how did you choose to move to this? Sure, yeah. So I I I was at eight and for. close to 3 almost 3 3 three and a half roughly little more than 3 3 years and uh, 8n networks went ipo in 2014 early 2014 uh, so and then i, I was there uh, till 2016 uh, and i could see that you know cloud has already taken over by 2016 you know it's everywhere uh, and then i need to sort of start understanding the cloud technologies more because that's going to be the future uh, and i felt that uh, The, the networking piece of it is still relevant, but it was kind of commoditized in the sense that you know everyone will just go to your, their respective cloud provider and request uh, that whatever they need, network appliance, uh, like load balancer, firewall, uh, from the cloud provider. And uh, layer two, layer three was already commoditized. Like you know, it's like you don't have to worry about it. Cloud infrastructure will take care of it. so what i felt was i need to learn uh, how how things work in cloud not just from the networking point of view but also you know in general how does compute get spun up how does storage work uh, and i was looking for opportunities to see if i can you know get a step into uh, the cloud side of things and at eta networks i was i started working on the layer 2 layer 3 vxlan support but eventually i sort of graduated to start working on their core product which was load balancer and i also helped them build uh, their first generation uh, data center firewall uh, so with that experience uh, what i got was at digital ocean they were looking for someone who could work on their load balancer as a service product mm-hmm. so this was perfect bridge for me again i mean i was i'm so fortunate that you know i i came across all these bridges that sort of allowed me to you know venture into a different line mm-hmm. uh, so uh, having worked on load physical load balancers at eta networks now it was time to you know get into the virtual load balancers at digital ocean 
Uh, so I interviewed with DigitalOcean, and interesting, the DigitalOcean at the time was a very remote, heavy company. Uh, and this is 2016 we are talking about. So uh, I get to work from home. Uh, you know, I don't have to leave my home. Uh, and, and then I get to work on the technologies that I want, always, like I wanted to work on. Uh, that was like a perfect, uh, you know, opportunity. Uh, and that's when I started working on, uh, at DigitalOcean. And initially, I think DigitalOcean to me was a little challenging for the first six months because the whole technology stack was different. Except for the domain knowledge, the whole tool, tool chain was completely different. Uh, before DigitalOcean, my experience was mostly on C, you know, C and o, GCC uh, uh, and those kinds of technologies working on Linux kernel, uh, packet parsing, you know, TCP packets, IP packets parsing. Uh, and then DigitalOcean was completely modern stack, as in like, you know, uh, I get to work on Golang, I get to, you know, okay. use uh, Chef, and uh, even the, the source code system was GitHub, which was new at, for me at the time. We were still using SVN and other uh, traditional uh, source code systems uh, okay. back at k Networks. So initial six months was a lot of learning, you know, a lot of catching up how things work in general, a lot of learning a new programming language. Uh, uh, but then I also get to witness how how cloud is structured, how how to build a cloud compute network storage, uh, and or uh, even the observability within the cloud. Uh, if you see in DigitalOcean, they have this monitoring, uh, in, uh, like droplet monitoring feature. How does that work? Uh, so I got exposed to a lot of new stuff that I was not aware of. So it was it was fun learning experience at DigitalOcean. Yeah, uh, we use like DigitalOcean and uh, Cisco and all the tools directly. But uh, uh, love to hear that how actually uh, those companies uh, grew up and how engineers made it work and how all the things got commoditized one by one. So that is a, a great story to understand. It's if someone goes through this podcast, they will get to know how actually th things worked in the business uh, IT business world. So yeah, yeah that's something enriching. Yeah, yeah. And after uh, Digital Ocean, the next leap you made uh, was to one of the popular companies, uh, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, tell us about that one as well. Sure. So, yeah. So, at Digital Ocean, to give some uh, context, at Digital Ocean, I worked on, again, on in the networking uh, team, but this was a cloud networking, not like the physical network uh, team. Uh, so, I worked on their features like uh, uh, load balancers, I worked on their firewalls, uh, and then DigitalOcean was a great, is a great company. I mean, I, I absolutely am fortunate to work for such a company. It's kind of very, I would say, new generation companies, like different vibe altogether within the company. Uh, remote friendly, uh, like people were great. Uh, so, uh, and then but digital ocean uh, was growing very fast, but uh, the target market of digital ocean is small to medium businesses. Uh, you know, uh, not the hyperscalers as they term it. Uh, mm -hmm. Hyperscalers mean clouds like AWS or uh, Azure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was getting a lot of experience in building the cloud. Uh, for three years, I got that experience. Uh, but what a critical aspect that I felt I was missing was the scale, right? How, how, do, how do things work when there are like 10,000 compute instances within a VPC? How do things work when you start receiving, you know, like millions of requests per second? What, what, what happens? Uh, and in general, how, how things work for a real, for a large scale enterprise? Uh, because many customers uh, at DigitalOcean were not big. I mean, they were smaller customers paying like $500 or less per month. Uh, so, you know, moderate or to a little less uh, scale. Uh, so, and this is 2019, I said, okay, I maybe let's see what's available uh, around if I can get an opportunity to work on some large scale uh, systems. Uh, and that's when uh, I reached out to one of my friend at Cisco who was at who, who is at Netflix. 
uh, and I said, hey, are there any opportunities? And he referred me uh, to a cloud networking team at Netflix. Uh, and I applied, I interviewed, uh, and, you know, uh, they uh, fortunately got accepted. So, uh, yeah, that's how I ended up at uh, Netflix. Okay. So, so I have heard that Netflix was initially working on a monolithic structure and they revamped it with uh, Go microservices later. So, so when you joined, was that transition also completed or was it a part of it? Sure. So Netflix uh, is a majorly a, a Java shop uh, okay. from the product standpoint. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, you know, all the services are majorly in Java. Uh, and my the team that I joined uh, is, is the cloud infrastructure engineering team, uh, you know, which manages their AWS infrastructure. So Netflix runs on AWS, right? Uh, so there is a team uh, who manages all the infrastructure that they that they that they use on AWS. So we were like an intermediate team uh, between the actual developers who write your netflix applications or billing applications and Mm -hmm. uh, the aws because uh, having large number of engineers you don't want all the product engineers to know about all the infrastructure details because Mm -hmm. that detracts them from their business logic right they they need to focus on their business logic and not worry about the infrastructure details so our my team at the time was providing this platform uh, abstraction to these developers to make uh, use of AWS easier for them. Uh, so when I joined, uh, my my team uh, was not like it had tools uh, for in Python for doing few things, uh, but the Go GoLang usage was not uh, that big, and I was one of the early initial adopters of the Go programming language. I built a lot of tooling around. Uh, making use of Go easier uh, within Netflix or other engineers can also take uh, make use of that. So like at Netflix, uh, we had a tooling uh, so that if you want to start writing a new application, uh, you run that tool, uh, give your application name, and it will generate a basic stub code for you uh, to start writing your code. Uh, and that sort of integrates with, you know, the internal other tools that Netflix also has, like, you know, your... Uh, mutual uh, mutual authentication tools uh, and uh, your logging observability tools because all the applications within that company should use the same observability tool or for same authentication authorization uh, mtls uh, tool uh, so the so i wrote a golang support for such tool so that any engineer who wants to write a golang application can run that tool they will get a basic stub code with all these features integrated mm-hmm. uh, and then i also built uh, a, a service which sort of handles the the abstraction of of the network addressing because netflix being such a huge infrastructure using company uh, the network addressing, specifically the IP addresses usage was huge. So we needed, like, you don't want engineers to remember what IP addresses they need to allow uh, for in the firewall, uh, like, you know, security groups or firewall uh, for them to talk, for the other applications to talk to them. So we started naming those, app, those we created IP blocks, IP address blocks, and started naming them. So that they, all they care is that they need to know what name they need to allow rather than, you know, the actual numbers. Uh, it's like, you know, you don't want to remember phone numbers, but you want to remember a person's name. Uh, and then you type in the name, call them, um, doesn't matter what the underlying number is, right? So that's the abstraction we built at Netflix so that engineers can start, uh, you know, using, make, make their lives easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was my first uh, uh, project at Netflix when I joined. Yeah. So so it is uh, really impressive that the Netflix team was having some internal tooling for like creating stubs for new projects. So that was the impre- uh, a good uh, impressive thing from their side. But the things that you have done is also very uh, provocative, like building uh, Go support so that more engineers can join in and doing this abstraction part. So. So you really uh, made a difference at, at the, a, com- a company which is running at a big scale. So, yeah. so big shout out for that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I also spent a lot of time, uh, like when I after I joined within six eight months, you know, the pandemic started, and you know, we were we were all working from home. So I also spent a lot of time uh, because when I was working from home, I had little more time because I was not commuting to office. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we built a lot of tooling to understand uh, their network connectivity. So, for example, uh, Netflix has you know hundreds of thousands of compute instances or uh, virtual machines, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe you know half a million or more containers. Uh, mm-hmm. So they are all talking to each other. They are all microservices. They are all talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how how does the connectivity graph look like for a given application? Uh, mm-hmm. Who who is talking to you? who you are talking to. Uh, so we had one, there are two ways to understand this, right? One is from the configuration. You can go look at the firewall configuration and see what developers have sort of allowed applications to talk to. So you can build that graph uh, from the configuration. And the second aspect is you can build a similar graph from the observed traffic. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, if you observe all the traffic, uh, you know, between the applications, you can also build that graph. Uh, so we, we, what we were trying to do is we were trying to understand uh, the network depend or the, the service dependencies between each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we we built that tooling to understand you know the, the the service dependencies, which service is talking to which service based on configuration and based on observed traffic. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there was also another project that was sort of building on top of this is to uh, remove your or migrate your network connectivity to application connectivity because network connectivity is fine but at the application level you can still reject uh, the connections uh, when it comes to the application uh, so what we were doing is to make developers life easier uh, we were uh, taking the network graph and making it into application so that when 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 an, when an engineer creates their application uh, they go to their, uh, you know, uh, application deployment tool. Uh, and at Netflix, uh, they use a tool called Spinnaker, which is an open source tool by Netflix to manage their applications. Uh, and then you go to that tool, create a, uh, create your application, go to your application page and say which all applications you want to allow in, in, in on the ingress side, right? which applications can talk to you. Uh, so we took the network graph. We were taking the network graph and sort of retrofitting that into the application graph because we exactly know looking at the network graph that this IP address belong to uh, this service at this time. So we also knew from not just from the network topology who's talking to whom, but we also knew which application is talking to which application. So we took the network configuration and then we're trying to retrofit that into the application connectivity so that users only care about applications. They don't care about the network. Great, great, great. The, the, the main idea that uh, plotting the traffic into the service graph, like that, that must have helped you a lot to decide how the future infrastructure can look like because yep. you will know which, which, which are the bottlenecks and how, which portion is getting the most requests. So, so that was also cool. And then again, plotting the network uh, graphs with the application that was again like it was also technically also smart but also from the point of view of business so 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 this team uh, you and the guys together who were working on the infra so so what was the size of this team so uh, we were called uh, cne cloud network engineering team and we had seven to eight engineers but again uh, cne uh, was looking at everything cloud networking within Netflix. So you name it like uh, DNS, Mm -hmm. uh, the security groups that I was talking about, the the observability. uh, uh, We had a T we had people working on IPv6, uh, uh, you know, migrating Netflix to start using IPv6. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, We had team who sort of managed, or we had a person who managed uh, uh, the VPC configuration between different uh, VPCs and different accounts because Netflix has you know, just has more than you know it has more accounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and then uh, mo- and then uh, multiple regions. So someone has to main- connect 
for configure low, uh, the the VPC NAT gateways, private links to make mm -hmm. all this connectivity happen. So we had we had a person doing uh, or or the team itself did that. So but we had a one person who specialized in doing that. So uh, uh, all around, even though we were like seven eight people, uh, we we had we pretty much covered every aspect of cloud networking that you can imagine mm -hmm. uh, at Netflix. So it used like either one or two people were mostly focused on a, a particular aspect, be it like security groups, observability, DNS, or IPv6, or uh, the VPC connectivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel for applications like Netflix, uh, this uh, particular division is more important, the networking team. But what was the ratio of the full team size and so what was the full team size and because you are the seven engineers working on that so so were there like 100 or 200 engineers running the whole uh, system or more yeah so uh, i was part of cne which was rolled in which kind of is part of cie cloud infrastructure engineering so okay. network is just part of uh, infrastructure we had a compute team uh, the compute team uh, uses like you know the containers and ec2 instances so they manage that uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, there were uh, teams uh, who did uh, you know uh, cloud gateway like you know uh, the gateway the api gateway that you know all the uh, netflix api mm -hmm. traffic comes in uh, mm -hmm. so like when you open your netflix app you see your uh, tiles or movie rows and subtitles and synopsis uh, so all of those and uh, your app itself is making API call uh, to the backend. So there was a team who managed that API gateway. Uh, uh, so there, like, and then there were a lot. Of, there were internal teams who who were doing like service mesh uh, implementation within Netflix for applications uh, to start using service mesh internally. Uh, uh, so that there was a team who, who did that. There was a team who did uh, the kernel net, kernel level, uh, you know, uh, stuff for Linux kernel. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a team, and this is all within cloud infrastructure engineering. There was a team mm -hmm. uh, who did performance engineering, uh, capacity engineering, like how much capacity do we need? Because capacity changes based on uh, the time of the day within different region, mm -hmm. and also the season. Uh, you tend to have more uh, traffic during, you know, holidays, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving uh, time frame than mm -hmm. your regular, you know, a week in, in, in February, for example. So mm -hmm. there was a team who did that capacity management. So all in all, I, I think CIE as a whole was, I think, at around uh, 80 to 100, if I'm not wrong, uh, mm -hmm. at the time, uh, that it was that big. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a really big team. So, so who makes the call that now we need a new department, like saying we need a performance division or we need a capacity division? So, who makes that call? I think it generally comes from uh, uh, the observation that you know we have a gap uh, in this area, uh, mm -hmm. and usually the leadership, uh, the director, senior director, VPs, uh, they say, sort of decide to fill in the gap uh, by either making a team or make or reorganizing the the teams to sort of carve out this team mm -hmm. uh, because there's naturally sometimes people uh, lean towards uh, certain aspects uh, so if there are people who are naturally doing more of let's say performance engineering or capacity engineering kind of work they'll, they'll form a team and uh, let them try or let them have that thing as their charter uh, so it's it mostly comes from observing that there are gaps and you know that those need to be filled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so this is what I found as a difference between product and service teams, a uh, service uh, kind of companies. That in product companies they are really uh, specific about what kind of uh, designations they have, like uh, network engineers, and also in the network engineers they have categories like performance capacity and all those. And where, whereas service companies look more for like uh, engineers who have generic knowledge of the domain because they don't know what kind of projects they might be getting in. But yeah. with the product, you get this benefit because you are working on one focused thing and you can you have this power to decide what what kind of engineers and what uh, kind of team you want to have. Yep. But, yep. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Then, and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, uh, we would like to <laughs> listen more from you. No, so, totally. Which, uh, so, yeah. so, uh, so at Netflix, uh, mm -hmm. I was not actually working on the product. If you observe, right? Like I, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not working on, on your application, Netflix app that runs on your phones, TVs, uh, yeah. uh, or other devices or, mm -hmm. but we were part of what is called platform engineering. So we mm -hmm. provide platform for other engineers to write a code or software. Uh, so, so that you were platform like behind the scenes of behind the scenes, like correct, too interesting. Correct. So, and, and so, so our customers, like customer, our as in the platform engineering's customers are all internal. Like you mm -hmm. go talk to uh, the the subtitling team, billing team, or uh, encoding team. Uh, like you know that because all these uh, movie footage that gets uh, uh, into a raw format, someone has to encode it into different uh, format. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go talk to uh, these different teams internally within Netflix, and then they, they they are your customers. You solve their problems so mm -hmm. that they can ultimately solve Netflix's problems, right? So yeah. that uh, so we were behind the scenes, uh, but also if the platform goes down, Netflix goes down, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't yeah. press a play button if the platform <laughs> is down. So so yeah, so you it's kind of providing you know how, how like the road infrastructure for you know transportation to happen mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was some analogous to that that you're providing a platform for netflix applications to run yeah yeah so now i understand that it was really independent of how application works so like the application can have a full revamp but still the infra will have the same responsibility of holding on to the traffic and uh, con configuring the VPC settings and handling all the traffic. Right. So that's a, yeah. So that's yeah, because, a, uh, really, yeah. yeah, because there are a lot of aspects that, you know, uh, not every application engineer is aware of because they come from different backgrounds. Some might be, you know, Node.js, JavaScript person, the other person might be a Java person or uh, you name it, right? C, C++, foreign coding apps. Uh, mm -hmm. So they usually they don't, uh, understand the nitty gritties of how a public cloud works, AWS works, mm -hmm. what are the nuances of doing something uh, uh, in the cloud. And that's where the platform engineers come in, where they bring in their expertise of their cloud understanding, their mm -hmm. infrastructure understanding. Uh, think about it, you know, when you when you run your uh, code today, do you, how many times do you think of what if you're run, you running on Linux, how many times do you think how Linux kernel is doing the process management of the code that you are running on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's kind of, because it's been abstracted so beautifully for you, you typically yeah. don't think about it. But there has to be some engineers who are actually working on improving that every time you, you get a new kernel or a new feature, right? So, so it's analogous to that. Yeah. Uh, in the in the DevOps uh, field, like I, I feel most of the developers start from the uh, development portion and then they got interested in how things work actually on clouds or on scale. And then they start to learn the ops part, like how, how to deploy this on cloud, how to how to dockerize the project and orchestrate the project. But, but uh, for your story, you have been in the ops from the very start on the networking side and deployment. So, so when do you think you started on the development part, or, or you have, uh, or you haven't touched development much during the journey? So, development, we did write a lot of code at Netflix. So, mm -hmm. the uh, the IP address abstraction that I was talking about, or the the taking the the network connectivity and then uh, uh, folding it up to the application connectivity piece. That all needed a lot of code uh, because then you have to go uh, look at your observed traffic, write code to first do that observability. So at Netflix, they, we built a solution uh, for doing that, that you know, an agent runs on every instance uh, that collects your network traffic. Uh, it's mm -hmm. an eBPF based agent that used to collect all the TCP level traffic, send it to a big data uh, for analysis and we are where we could run the queries and that would give us the, the graph of the application connectivity based on the observed network traffic. So all that needed code, right? Like writing an agent, uh, you know, requires writing a uh, code. 
Uh, so we wrote a lot of code at Netflix in addition to, of course, having the infrastructure, you know, IAC kind of tooling available. But even that was a lot of Python code who that sort of went and deployed different constructs within AWS using AWS APIs. Uh, so I feel DevOps, in addition to managing the infrastructure, understanding how the infrastructure works, also needs a lot of coding uh, as well if you want to get it right. Um, you can write Terraform, Ansible, uh, you know, cloud formation, uh, uh, but to be to better handle your infrastructure, you will need tooling uh, to manage your infrastructure, understand your infrastructure, or orchestrate your infrastructure uh, better uh, as you grow. I see. Yeah. So, so it seems like you had really good learning curves whenever you switched from one company to another and had a, uh, luckily had a really good bridges for switching the technology. And then you came to middleware, uh, leaving the Netflix behind. So, so how was that? How was the story behind that? Yeah. So, uh, during pandemic, uh, you know, I, I was also helping one other person, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, we were trying to brainstorm something, you know, if we can start, mm -hmm. build something, uh, you know, in, in the network security or cloud security space where mm -hmm. we could, uh, where we can we redefine uh, how the security is done uh, in the cloud uh, networking. So I always wanted to, having worked for, you know, 15, 16 eight years back then, I, I always wanted to see if I can start something, start working from scratch mm -hmm. uh, on something. Uh, and we, I worked with uh, my friend, or uh, like helped my friend for for little more, more than a year, and mm -hmm. then I could see that uh, the idea is good, but the market is not there. I mean, uh, uh, because of the way you know uh, the the cloud vendors also evolve, they they start putting in uh, the solution that kind of breaks the market that the idea you are working on, right? So mm -hmm. I could. I felt that even though the idea is good, uh, the adoption wouldn't be great because of the, the tooling that cloud providers have already introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I, I said, okay, let's take a step back. Let's see what, what else can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I was, I knew, uh, I like I built some observability at Netflix from network standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. but I was always curious as to how observability would work on the application side or, you know, uh, the other aspects like logs, metrics, traces, events, how do that, how do I, how do those work? And we had tool set Netflix that did that, uh, but I, I felt that, that they could be modernized. Uh, and then uh, they did start using, uh, there was a team who, who built those tools uh, at Netflix and they did start using uh, open telemetry. And that's when I came across open telemetry agent within Netflix where one fine day, uh, I reached out to that team and said, hey, I want some telemetry for this new application that I'm building. And they said, here is your open telemetry configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I went and looked at that and then kind of got curious on this whole effort of open telemetry that is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in, in May, uh, I, th I felt, okay, it's time, it's been four years I've been at Netflix. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe if I can get a good opportunity uh, to, and to start working on something ground up, that would be great. And that's when I was already talking with LD uh, Laduram, a, a middleware CEO, uh, to see if I can join because middleware was looking for a founding engineer uh, back then. Uh, so I, I talked with LD, uh, met him a few times, and yeah, things just worked out. Yeah, great. And and I am lucky to have worked with Tejas at middleware, and we are still. Uh, working hard on, on expanding <laughs> our project on onto different horizons of observability. So, so yeah, we uh, Tejas have also given some uh, good uh, suggestions on our current product, the middleware, on the infra side, and also for teaching the developers how they can improvise on and on their current skill sets. So, so I would uh, again shout out to Tejas for that one. So, so yeah, this this was I think the journey from the uh, schooling up to now. How they just have switched uh, his career paths and what he has learned along the way. So.
so now we can go more into like uh, question answer stuffs and not into, sure uh, i i think the story portion we have covered <laughs> everything <laughs> No, and, and before you go, like, it's been incredible working with you, uh, Keval, as well. Like, you know, you're, you're a great engineer, uh, you know, who understands the technology, very quick to grasp things. Uh, so I consider myself fortunate to work with uh, you and everyone else at Middleware. So motivated to get, you know, success, uh, build a company ground up. Uh, everyone is so motivated and energized, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's a it's humble of stages for appreciating us after working this many years in in this particular field, but <laughs> still encouraging us. And yeah, we we take that appreciation with uh, with uh, respect, and we'll try to uh, upskill uh, onwards. So, yep. so yeah, so re uh, let's wrap up the story portion now. Let, uh, another question uh, or another big topic that I wanted to address today is. Like a few weeks back, we, me and Tejas had this discussion. Uh, I, I shared a, a technical problem that me and my dad sometimes struggle with having data storage on phones and we run out of the Google Drive storage and how, how we should uh, go about that. And one thing that uh, Tejas told me at the time that, why don't you have a server of your own at the home? And then we started discussing on the point and I came to know that Tejas has a home lab so I would like to know how your how you started creating a home lab and how how does it look today? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, uh, having worked in the, this infrastructure space, right? I was always curious to try out different things, and not everything you can try out at work, right? Because of mm -hmm. of the security limitations or the policy limitations, mm -hmm. but you are free to do whatever you want at your home. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so what? What initially, what I started playing was with a bunch of Raspberry Pis when it came out, like uh, more than ten years ago. I got mm -hmm. the first Raspberry Pi installed, uh, you know, the OS uh, Raspbian on uh, on it, and and then you know I had my first home server, be it severely underpowered, but that's what I had, mm -hmm. and I, I I sort of hosted a, a very lightweight personal home page for a long time on that uh, sir on that raspberry 512 meg raspberry pi server it was like slow but it worked and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and not that i was getting huge amount of traffic but uh, it was a good learning experience to you know start getting to the home labbing uh, setup mm -hmm. uh, so I, I ran that for for a long time you know he helped me also understand how uh, how 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 customers deploy things in their environment because I was working on on the computer networking appliances right deep into the kernel. So that kind of uh, clouds your visibility into how the actual data center is built or data center is deployed, right? Uh, so then once you have your server of your own, you start to see, hey, what are the security, you know, Things that I need to consider now. Now I need to open up a port on my my home router to talk to allow incoming traffic. What are the security considerations? Mm -hmm. How do I make my server more secure or use like IP tables or you know those technologies? Uh, so that sort of uh, was orthogonal to my work, but still related and helped me understand uh, you know the customer's point of view who are actually using the products. Uh, mm -hmm. And then over time, I I got few more Raspberry Pis, you know, got like, you know, Raspberry Pi 3s in, in 2015 or 2016 timeframe uh, uh, when it came out uh, and ha created like a Kubernetes cluster out of it. Uh, 2016, 2017 Kubernetes was picking up. I wanted to learn Kubernetes. Uh, so I created a small, you know, uh, five node Kubernetes cluster on Raspberry Pis uh, and then sort of moved uh, my website from from a single server to you know now pods on on Kubernetes cluster, uh, so that was again a good learning experience, uh, and it was also it, it helped me understand Kubernetes better uh, because at, at DigitalOcean we were also building uh, a CNI plugin like uh, the, con the container networking interface plugin for DigitalOcean. Uh, so, so it sort of helped me understand how to write a CNI plugin, how to how the networking works within Kubernetes, because there are a lot of uh, 
magic tricks that happen depending on the way you deploy kubernetes networking that you know you need to understand so because everything was in my own home network i could just do whatever i want and uh, not be concerned about you know the service going down the digital ocean going down uh, so I, I got that freedom so i set up a fine node kubernetes cluster played with it like anything uh, hacked it up uh, made mess out of it uh, and then eventually i said okay kubernetes is great raspberry pi is great but it's time to do something more serious uh, on the home labbing side so i got few uh, dell machines server machines uh, from ebay uh, and then uh, set up like the proxmox there is a hypervisor called proxmox which is uh, free uh, for home use uh, i set up proxmox hypervisor on them uh, launch bunch of virtual machines and alexi containers uh, to create different services on those machines so so i like now i moved my personal website from raspberry pi to these you know enterprise grade hypervisors and, and <laughs> server machines yeah yeah so really, that's really the journey <laughs> satisfying yeah really satisfying to do something on your own and, and it shows like your passion in the in the networking field that after, after the work as well you try to <laughs> Uh, make a use case out of it and and it, it really helped you in the real so so do you use it for just for uh, uh, up, uh, making your website online or do you use it for data storage and accessing it in your mobile yeah yeah so i i start once i have this uh, uh, you know enterprise gate server setup i started using it a lot more like i have a firewall running uh, on my home network uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's an open source firewall called pfsense uh, mm-hmm. which uh, which helps me prevent all the malicious traffic coming in and uh, from anything malicious going out of my home network uh, so like i have two daughters five years and 10 years with, you know and then and the electronic devices are everywhere these days like mm-hmm. ipads and tablets and phones tvs so i don't want them to do anything malicious so i can control uh, at the firewall level what gets into my home network and what gets out of my home network so that provides me a good a way to secure my home network secure access for them make sure they are safe you know not doing any not getting anything malicious from the internet uh, i run my uh, nas uh, servers on that cluster as well uh, i use a software called open media vault mm-hmm. uh, and then i have a bunch of disk reads configured uh, to uh, save uh, or backup all my data uh, on those on that open media vault cluster i backup mm-hmm. my you know photos that i take on my phone uh, or on my wife's phone all gets packed up uh, to that uh, raid cluster uh, uh, running on open media vault i run a dns blocker uh, called pyhole which kind of filters out the the advertisements or any malicious uh, websites or links at the dns mm-hmm. level it's a dns sinkhole mm-hmm. uh, and then I, uh, of course i run my personal website i run my wife's personal website uh, on that on it uh so yeah those are the few things uh, that i i run and i keep trying different uh, uh, tools or software that i come across but uh, i was running plex for a long time uh, but these days i don't get much time to watch tv so you know i i <laughs> yeah <laughs> i shut it down yeah i won't say there's a, a few use cases these are like um, you are taking the full advantage of what you have at your hands you are using it for security accessing your media keeping your websites open yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it so it's worked out great like you know uh, like i have a vpn server as well running on the same cluster so no matter where i am i can always uh, connect to my home network uh, you know and back up things or access my files uh, that i i don't have it on public cloud anywhere uh, so so yeah it it works out great yeah it's it's really uh, satisfying for an it engineer to use the <laughs> tech for for their own use 
and i i told you that i i'll uh, try to set up something like that but i haven't got any <laughs> time to do that but but once i get started I, i'll come in back to you for sure. for a day absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah so that was the second major thing that i wanted to address uh, after the journey that uh, the home lab setup because because uh, i think uh, many it engineers may consider doing this because because if you know how things work uh, on clouds why don't uh, replicate them in your in your own yeah. house and also as you said you can learn how uh, networking things work if you do right. by your own yeah. right now like initially uh, i was running only my website but now i run my wife's website as well so i need a load balancer uh, like an application level load balancer to do path based routing so i set up ha proxy uh, mm-hmm. in the cluster to do that for me so these use cases they teach you a lot they give you insights into how someone might use your product company's product that you are working for and in addition give you new ideas you know to start something of your own if you run into a problem look for solution nobody is solving it maybe that's mm-hmm. an idea you want to pursue yeah yeah that yeah yeah, yeah that's correct so so next thing i would uh, like to do is i would like to know about what you do other than the tech stuff like when you are not doing uh, development or not home home living how how do you spend time in your regular days like uh, oh yeah home? i mean <laughs> my my regular days these days are pretty uh, handful uh, i have 5 and 10 year old so a lot of uh, running around uh, taking them to different classes and you know uh taking care of them but in addition to that i also do a lot of hiking trails around here in, in the bay area so one mm-hmm. thing i'm fortunate enough to live in this area where we have wonderful hiking trails uh, you know you go 40 miles uh, this way you get ocean you go 40 miles this way you get <laughs> nice hills and you know so i uh, yeah. i do a lot of trails uh, hiking over the weekends mm-hmm. get into yeah, the nature are... that disconnect mm-hmm. from the technology for a while you know sort of uh, feel the nature you know shut down my phone or put it into like a silent mode and not be disturbed so i take i do a lot of that stuff these days as well yeah yeah i was about to ask that uh, how did you get the hiking in the bay area but uh, yeah you were just that that in the same city you have the hills portion as well as the beaches so yeah so. yeah yeah Yep. and then the, the the where i live it's like from one block there is a trail that starts that goes all the way on the hills mm-hmm. uh, so i i do that a lot uh, over the weekend just to you know get some fresh air and uh, disconnect for a while yeah and and do you like watch uh, watch stuff on uh, like uh, movies or tv series or stuff or, or you just spend the time away from the screen I I I try to avoid that uh, like even when I was at Netflix I rarely watch Netflix uh, so I I keep I kept joking at work that you know Netflix should just have kids subscription because all, it's only my kids who watch Netflix these days <laughs> uh, not me so I I don't uh, honestly I don't spend much time watching TV uh, these days uh, yeah. uh, one thing I also like to work on is on my cars so uh, so I do a lot of uh my car work myself uh, to my abilities so like you know mm-hmm. the oil change transmission oil change uh filters uh mm-hmm. a brake a brake ro- tire rotation brake oil change so i do a lot of that stuff every like 2 3 months uh i have two uh, petrol cars gasoline cars so i do a lot of maintenance myself uh for those cars uh, so i get to learn about how you know Uh, combustion engine car works in general uh, mm-hmm. so so that is also something i i do a lot okay yeah yeah so so for the for the last portion of our discussion i have some uh, i would say rapid fire questions uh, sure. so these are like some questions where i i'll give you some uh, options and you can answer in a word and and if you choose you can like elaborate that Uh, but but uh, a word will, will suffice if uh, if uh, the question uh, uh, tells uh, reminds you of a story uh, i i would encourage you to go into that but uh, yeah yeah let's see how how it goes i have some some small fun questions like four to five <laughs> sure yeah 
so okay so first one is uh, what kind of uh, work process do you prefer like work from home work from office or hybrid i love hybrid mm-hmm. uh because i i have worked 100% work from home uh, when i was a digital ocean uh, and early part of pandemic and then uh, the pandemic started to open up uh, i st- we started hybrid and i kind of love hybrid where you meet uh, the team a couple of days or more uh, a week and mm-hmm. then you know how you have focused time uh, to do your actual stuff uh, when when you are at home so i am a big fan of hybrid uh, hybrid work model okay so which were, uh, where where did you have the best uh, work culture netflix digital ocean aten or cisco oh that's a tough one i <laughs> think all the companies uh, were good uh, in different way uh, mm-hmm. but i think i i thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time at uh, digital ocean okay uh, what was uh, what is your favorite uh, part of work during the day so like client calls doing the code part reviewing the code team meetings oh <laughs> i think uh, of late i'm ta- started liking talking to people more like client mm-hmm. calls are more interesting uh, uh initial part of my career i found you know coding and focused to more interesting but these days i find talking to people trying to understand their problems how can we solve them mm-hmm. uh, i find it those more interesting these days okay uh if you could have one superpower that can help you in your it job what would it oh. be so so like time travel or having unlimited knowledge or having an intuition of the root cause of the problem no oh, i think uh uh unlimited i think intuition would be uh, something i would <laughs> like to have and in addition i would like to have like unlimited <laughs> memory uh, because i'm i'm very forgetful at times uh mm-hmm. so you know uh i would love to have like more memory retention or like <laughs> if i could have like unlimited memory retention that would be awesome because then i could recollect what happened 10 years ago uh, and then i can use that to my uh, benefit i see and and the last one is if if you were not into the it field which profession you would have opted for oh oh wow oh, oh. and this time oh, i don't have any one. options <laughs> <laughs> uh okay that's a good one that 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 kind of because i i already sort of i was so conditioned uh, to get <laughs> into some technology uh field I, i mean i would have started something of my own not related to it but you know something of my own i would have yeah. started maybe yeah. maybe not so glorious but something to do with cars or something because i am fascinated by cars <laughs> this is now you are uh, working in the observability field with middleware so what what do you think uh, the current stage of observability is and where where it is heading in upcoming years sure so i think observability is, is at a great place today uh, it has evolved a lot from very bare bones observability uh, you know the, the on host logs or or metrics uh, with but it with with the cloud uh, transformation happening there are a lot of fantastic companies and tools that have spun up that have just changed the observability game mm-hmm. uh, but uh, what i also feel it's still very nascent as to it's still very uh, basic or bare bones approach to observability where you go dig into your logs metrics traces events uh, to figure out what has happened uh, i feel uh, there is the next future is more about unifying all these signals into uh one uh, single uh, glass uh, of visibility where uh, a single pane of glass uh, where you don't care how the signal got there what you care is what is causing a particular issue or what or, or are you getting the insight that you want to get so i feel unifying all these signals into a unified view uh, is is certainly need of the hour uh, and uh, and and i observed this at netflix as well where we have gigabytes and gigabytes of logs and we are just that okay uh, what do i do with this or what do i do with these metrics uh, so uh, and with 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 you know uh, generative ai or ml uh, being a hot thing these days i think there's a perfect opportunity to blend or infuse these uh, ai ml technologies 
are ground up into observability. Again, I'm not saying uh, like mm -hmm. something like chat GPT or uh, just conversational AI tools where you ask questions, but I feel uh, these technologies has to be blended in, into uh, the observability signals or tools themselves, where they have to work behind the scenes to help in engineer troubleshooting the job, uh, the job of engineer troubleshooting the issue more easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and then there is whole new uh, domain that's coming up uh, because of the AI is the observability of AI tools themselves, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The models, how are the models behaving? Uh, how are they performing? What data are they generating? Because we need some telemetry into the behavior of the, those models. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like uh, are those can those models be trusted? Uh, are those models responsible? So these are completely different metrics now that that the industry has to come up with uh, that as to how to observe uh, the, this ML or AI systems to be you know so that people trust them more. So I think that's the next phase of observability. Yeah, yeah. I, I I ask this because I think you are the correct person to because you have worked uh, in the different fields of IT and uh, that will give you a good opportunity to extrapolate how uh, the future will look like. Like like earlier, I uh, took an interview of my friend who is quite pro in the Kubernetes. And for him, I asked what what is the future of the orchestration and containerization stuff. So for you, I thought uh, asking about the future of observability will be more suitable. And and I agree on your opinion that I think observability will be an, in a mature state where people will not have to understand how it came, but they can actually focus on the problem. So so there will be a good amount of abstraction on the collection details and mm -hmm. people will be able to use it uh, day to day life. Good. Yeah. Uh, okay, Tejas, uh, about, uh, about the ending before we sign off, uh, I just had a, this question and I think as a colleague you might be able to help uh, if you have any Netflix credentials uh, because you worked at Netflix and maybe you have a few that you can share and we can share it to our channel so people might be able to use it. Yeah, sure. You can have, uh, there's a username called Tejas017. Okay, hold on. There is someone at the door. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, Tejas, maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we are not sure if Tejas will be coming back, uh, but but I'll put the rest of the username and password once I get connected with him. And I'll, put, I'll try to put it in the description, I promise. Mm -hmm.